rápido. Welcome to the Wicked movie video. This is going to be a video on Wicked part one. I was really debating on whether or not I was even going to do this video because so many people are talking about it. I know I'm not the most well-versed on Wicked lore, but after watching it, I think it's just something I have to chime in on and I'm really nervous to share my thoughts because some of my thoughts do not align with majority of what I've been seeing. I enjoyed the movie. I was entertained throughout the movie, but I do have some thoughts that I want to share with you guys. So first things first, I have not read the book. As we know, uh, anytime there is a book, I probably haven't read it and I probably won't read it, but I have seen the stage production of Wicked. I saw it in 2018 when I went to New York for the very first time and I watched it on Broadway. It was a very fun experience. I loved it, but as you just heard, that was in 2018. So my memory of the source material is a little bit skewed because it's been so long. So I'm not gonna be comparing it to the stage musical in a way that is referencing the parts that they miss and the parts that they changed because I can remember a lot of things, but that stage production is not something that is like in the forefront of my mind. None of this is going to be a comparison to the source material. It's just going to be strictly critiques of the movie itself and not in relation to the stage production or the book. So before I saw the movie, I also saw a lot of reviews before I went to see the movie. So I saw a lot of critiques and I saw a lot of praise. So what I wanted to do was kind of jot down a little bit of those critiques and praise before I went into the movie and then come out of the movie and see whether I agreed or disagreed with either side. Thank you Parade for sponsoring today's video. The holidays are coming around and gift giving is happening and I'm here to give you the best deal yet. Whether you're gifting your bestie a brand new bra or just treating yourself to some new undergarments or new sleepwear this season, Parade has got you covered. I used to only wear lacy, uncomfortable, non-stretchy and little to no gusset area whenever I was choosing my underwear and after trying Parade's replay thongs, I am not going back to anything else. These are so comfortable. They have a nice waistband that doesn't dig into your hips or stomach and it's actually got enough gusset area to where my cooter stays within it and it has a nice thong that does not hurt my butt because if you've ever worn a thong, you know that some thongs really hurt. Like it's not even just like a little bit of a discomfort. It hurts. And with Parade's replay line, this fabric and this material is perfect for extreme comfort, especially during the holidays where everybody's wearing comfy things. But guess what also wants to be comfortable? Your butt. Right here is the crown blue and the balloon shade within their line. And I also have eight ball, which is just their standard black color. And replay was actually out of stock for a long time. This is brought back by popular demand. It is their first fabric they had ever launched with Parade. And it is by far my favorite fabric from Parade. Now I've become a cup bra hater recently. There's nothing more uncomfortable than wearing a wire bra. I've been all about the bralette. This is the luxur this is the luminous glow triangle bralette, which is a standard bralette triangle bralette as it states. It's a really thin back, but it also has this basically like bungeed up fabric, so it's not digging into your back. I have a really hard time finding bras that fit my cup size while also fitting my band size because I have a bigger band size but a smaller cup size. And with this, I don't have to deal with sacrificing my rib cage so my boobies can breathe. And there's nothing better than the luminous glow fabric on your skin. It's so silky smooth, it's so amazing, and this has been my go-to for basically braless season because I don't wanna be wearing cups and wires and, and, and dealing with the like, it, discomfort during this holiday season. I wanna be warm, cozy, comfy, and that requires a comfy undergarment as well. And running from November 29th to December 3rd, Parade is running their best sale yet. This is gonna be 30% off site-wide, but with my code TRIN-BF, this gives you 50% off your entire order. This is gonna be the best sale that you're gonna find from Parade. It is perfect for the holiday season, whether or not you're treating all your friends and family to some new undergarments or treating yourself after the whirlwind of a year it's been. 
You deserve a treat and so does everybody else. So use this sale to treat yourself. Thank you so much for Parade for sponsoring this video. And without further ado, let's get started. Some of the rave reviews that I was seeing were for the sets and the production design. I was seeing a lot of rave reviews for the practical effects that they actually used. A lot of the stuff that was shown within the film was actually built instead of CGI'd in, which is really cool. Obviously wardrobe and costume design and hairstyling and styling of all sorts was majorly praised for this movie, which I completely agree with. I think that the costumes were flawless. They were so unique, but it also in a sense so familiar as we know the characters to be. So it was so unique and such a revival of these kind of old characters that have been around for a long time, but still felt so familiar to what we've known. So it was a really cool rendition of that. Some of the other praises were the acting by the two main leads and also the singing, of course. And singing is undeniably this film's major strong suit. I don't know how you could make this movie without that being a strong suit, but it is quite literally the thing that holds this whole entire film together is the powerhouse of these two main vocalists driving the story forward. I don't know if anyone else could have really driven that story that hard through just voice than these two main leads of Cynthia Erivo and Ariana Grande. So just a roundup of the critiques that I've seen of the movie. I've seen critiques for the color grading, the sound mixing. I've seen critiques for the length of the film and how long it actually feels while watching. Wicked, as we know, is a fairly political story. It's kind of about a fascist regime within the movie. It's about them taking away the rights to the animals because they want to use them. It's about defying the government. It's about defying uh, the status quo of it all. So it's a quite political movie. And I think one thing that the film succeeds really well in is making a world that's easy to follow. I think that I get really confused when watching these really fantastical stories and really big uh, worlds that I have to be introduced to. But Wicked through the movie was really easy to follow in my opinion. I was really able to grasp the concepts of what they were trying to build, the pillars that they were trying to put up to tell you what the world is, what's going on, and make it really easy for the audience to understand the complexities of the characters within it. Because I think the biggest thing about Wicked is that every single character is going through this internal battle of being good or wicked. It's this constant battle of everybody that is seen as good is just good. And everybody that is seen as wicked is just wicked when there's so much more going on and that really everybody is wicked. They just know how to hide it better. As much as I know that Wicked is quite a mature story, especially from the source material of the book, I think that a lot of kids are gonna be seeing this and I want, I really wanted to go into that for it to be easy to digest so people that are younger can digest the story easily. And me, because apparently my media literacy is failing. Let's go over things that I did like because I love the opening scene. I love No One Warns the Wicked. I love that the first thing that you hear within the movie is Glinda's voice. That's perfect. I think that's brilliant. I think that it's already great that she's already telling the story and putting her own perspective on it, which is kind of like really important to the plot of Wicked is that everybody is hearing what happens to Alphaba through Glinda, which is obviously a biased and misconstrued version of what goes on. Are people born wicked? Or do they have wickedness thrust upon them? And so I love that scene and I love getting to see close up on Glinda because with stage productions and with musicals in general, one of the things that is really uh, different from stage productions and movies is that you don't get a lot of facial acting because the audience is so far away. So a lot of musical theater and a lot of play and stage acting is very theatrical. It's very out there. It's very big. Whereas movie acting is much more subtle and it has a lot to do with facial expressions. So I'm really happy that they zoned in on that for these characters in this movie because it's so unfamiliar to the Wicked fans because the only thing that you've seen is everything that they specifically tell you 
within the musical because if they don't specifically say it or do it in an action, you won't be able to get it because you can't see their faces. So I love the scene of No One Mourns the Wicked because you really can see Glinda grappling with the fact that, you know, she was best friends with Elfie and not only that, but that the song is really not talking about Elfie at all. It's talking about Glinda. She's talking about how she's going to die alone, that no one will mourn her when she's gone because she's just as wicked as people are perceiving Elphaba to And that's a constant theme that I really like throughout the entire movie is focusing on the silent moments between the characters because it's something so different from what the stage production gives. One thing that I was absolutely obsessed with in this movie, and it's like kind of something that I'm obsessed with in like every single movie, but it's just like the talking animals, like the bear nanny that took care of Elfie when she was a baby was just like everything to me. Like, where is she now? Like, where is, where's the bear because she was so amazing. I don't know, they just seem so realistic. Every single time an animal was talking, I was like, no, exactly, like they should. I just really love talking animals within film. So like the whole concept of in this film is that like the entire plot is that they're getting their rights taken away and they're no longer allowed to speak. The animals should be seen and not heard. Like that really got to me because it's like some of my favorite things within media is watching animals talk, especially CGI animals, like in Narnia, or Wicked. I just find it to be really cool. Um, shout out Peter Dinklage because he ate as Dr. Dillamon. He fucking ate. I absolutely loved him as a go. Uh, such an emotional performance from a go and I was almost in tears from his scenes, especially when he starts losing the capability to talk that was like really making me sad and emotional. And I just props to whoever was doing the CGI work on the animals because they were really emotional. Even the, the flying monkeys, when they get the spell cast on them, that they have, that the, they start getting wings and go through the transformation, the pain and the anguish that they're in, it really does like, it really did get to me. Like they looked really like, they looked like they were suffering and it made me feel really bad. And like, just all around, like you, I mean, you cannot make Wicked without showing the, the pain and the suffering that the animals are going through because that's the whole point. We're supposed to feel bad for them because they should have the right to speak. Imagine living in a world where animals don't speak. I don't know what I would do. And I'll tell you who I fucking hate within this movie. I'll tell you who I fucking hate. So if I love the animals, I love Elfie. Uh, I fucking hate Nessa Rose because why was she so mean? You wanna see something wonderful? Yeah. It's like, she loves her papa. She loves her papa so much. And she's like, oh my God, dad, like, thank you. Like, you're like, so nice, thank you. Um, The dad's the reason why you suffer. Like, your dad's the reason why your mom died. You know that, right? It's not Elphaba's fault, it's your dad. Sure, we can see the, the, the butterfly effect, but whose choice was it? It wasn't Elfie's. Elfie's didn't give your mom the milk flowers or milk bones or whatever they were called. Your papa did, but I don't see papa getting the hate that Elfie does when papa's the one that killed your mom. I don't know how she has the audacity to be like, Elfie's so weird and such an outcast when she also is in the minority of things as well. Am I not mistaken? Both of them are minorities in a sense. And not to mention everybody at Shiz is fucking weird. Just because you guys aren't green does not mean you're not fucking weird. I don't understand that. Especially there's a scene where Elfie goes into the ballroom and has her hat on and there's this fuck ass girl literally laughing at her in a choppy like blonde, like it's literally a bob and it's chopped up. It looks horrible. She's in a flapper girl dress. She looks horrible, horrible. And she's laughing at Elfie for wearing a cool hat. I will kill you because every one of those freaks at Shiz is weird. They're all weirdos. Like why the fuck is Bach not getting made fun of? His hair is crazy and nobody wants to make fun of him. And by the way, you're all 40. By the way, everybody at Shiz is fucking old. And that's one thing that made me pause. <laughs> It didn't take me fully out, but there were some times where I was like, no close-ups on Ethan Slater because he has fucking stubble. Like he has full fucking stubble and you're expecting me to believe that he's some shy little nerd boy munchkin in Shiz University. That man has to pay his taxes. Like it did not take me out fully. It did make me pause. 
and you're lying if you did not pause at the 40 year old class you did everyone paused for a second and that's okay that's okay grease also makes me it puts me in a coma for a second that's how bad grease is wicked is not that but i will say it's like Bo and Yang and his little sidekick uh, snickering at 35 years old. You better shut the fuck up. You better shut the fuck up and go put a down payment on that house, sweetie. Stop. But it's like, fuck Nessa Rose, but also kind of fuck Bach because it's like Bach like also is a bitch. <laughs> and like, no offense to Ethan Slater. Like I don't have this like big hatred in my heart for him. Like. I don't love him though. I'm not on that train where it's like, you know what, after seeing the Wicked movie, I really like him. No, like he's very neutral to me. He's not someone that I think about. He's not someone that I plan to think about and that's okay. He's not thinking about me. I'm not thinking about him. Like he's a very neutral character in this movie for me. I'm excited to see where he goes in part two though. But like in this movie, he really didn't like, like the only parts that I really liked is when he was like, kind of like blushing over Fiero, which like same, no net positive or net negative. No, no, no plus or minus, just, just stagnant. Jonathan Bailey, A, I absolutely loved him. Like have loved him since Bridgerton season two. Like that is Papa, that is like a Papa dearest. Like I love him. I think he's everything to me. I He basically only had like two scenes that were like impactful to the movie but like thank god for those two scenes because it's like dancing through life was like one of the best sequences i've ever seen ever i think that was one of their best sequences throughout the entire movie his dancing was so good in this it was giving me the same energy of like mike feist within west side story like it was just so mesmerizing it was so good to see it's like so good to see like good male dancers back on the big screen. It's like what we've needed for such a long time. And not only that scene where he really showcases his talent within singing and dancing, I loved his scenes with Cynthia. I thought the scene where they go off to save the cub, of course, was really sweet, filled with chemistry. For for the foreshadowing that it's set up, for, for how like vague and kind of like, uh, it's not supposed to be super in your face already. I think they had good chemistry and I liked their scenes together. I think he's so fast and charming and flirty. I think it just works so well. Like when he's like, will you let ever let me talk? And then she's like, actually no, like I'm not gonna let you talk. Like I love that scene between them. I thought it was really good. And I think they like meshed really well together. My three favorite musical numbers. So this is not just about how they, this is not really about the song necessarily. This is about the sequence in itself, how it looks and like the visual aspects of it. Dancing Through Life, What Is This Feeling, Popular. Those three songs visually and the scene that they created, the world that they created within those songs, very well. What is this feeling? The reason why I like what is this feeling so much is that it shows the time, the passage of time within the movie, which I think throughout a lot of the other sequences within the movie, it doesn't do that very well. A lot of the times I love it within a musical when a song can really show the passage of time because a lot of points within musicals is to show it through song rather than exposition, song, more exposition. I don't like it when someone has to explain something and then sing a song about it. I would like the song to explain it. And I think What Is This Feeling does that really well. We don't need arguments on arguments on arguments between Glinda and Elfie before the song. So I love it that it goes straight into the first night that they're there. It already goes into the song and the loathing that they have for each other and showing the passage of time, how long it's been since they've been there. And throughout that song, showing Elfie and Michelle Yeoh's character having private lessons. I love that it's showing all of that within that one song. Another sequence that I really did like was The Wizard and I. I thought The Wizard and I was a really good sequence. I loved seeing that from Elfie. The one thing that I hated from that scene is how gray it was it's like this big landscape shot where she's in like a wheat field and you see the blue of the sky and the and the yellow of the hay and it's like gray it's like not colorful at all she's spelting out the wizard and i and i still be with the wizard it's so good it she sounds so good it's so emotional and it's literally like saturation negative six like, 
you couldn't give me anything. You couldn't give me fucking anything. My all time favorite scene throughout the movie, like above musical numbers, above, you know, the ending climactic scene of the movie, like better than Defying Gravity, better than, you know, any of the sort, better than popular. My favorite scene in the entire movie is the ballroom scene between Glinda and Elfie, where Glinda finally comes to her and dances with her after everybody is making fun of Elfie for wearing the hat that Glinda gave her. It like almost brought me to tears. It was such a powerful scene. I loved it. I loved unspoken scenes like that within the film. I think it worked so well for what they were trying to create, especially between Glinda and Alfie. I think that a lot of what happens between them is unspoken and this kind of back and forth that they have is unspoken and I really love that scene where they just start everybody's making fun of Elfie for dancing she's like trying to show everyone up and show everyone that she's strong and she doesn't care and even Fierro's like I, I give it to her like she doesn't even care what anyone thinks and then Glinda's like no like she cares like a lot like I can tell because Glinda cares like Linda knows exactly how she feels because Glinda cares even more about what people think of her than Elfie. And so when she finally gives in and joins her and, 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 you know, gives her that camaraderie, that, 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 that friendship within that moment where she feels so isolated and alone and it's all so unspoken and it's her attempting to mimic her and be with her within this moment and mimic the dance moves that she's doing and do that routine together was really sweet and really powerful and I loved that scene. That was my favorite, favorite, favorite scene like nothing could top it, not even a musical number. And I know that's crazy to say, I love music and I love the musical numbers within this movie. Nothing could top that ballroom scene. I thought it was so magnificent, perfectly done. I think the pacing of it was perfect. I love seeing that turmoil that Glinda goes through after she realizes that like she backstabbed Alfie and Alfie actually did something nice for her in return by getting her private lessons with Madame Marble. I think like, it was just perfect. Out of every single scene in Wicked part one, that one, like no notes, no notes. So, so amazing. And then you go into popular right after that. It's perfect. That specifically, and I don't see enough people actually getting into their thoughts about it. I think a lot of, I see a lot of people posting like the tears obviously and you know that Cynthia has within those scenes and everyone's just kind of posting screenshots being like this scene, so good but like the actual like essence of the scene and the dynamic between the two characters it's the strongest in the movie in my opinion within that scene i would say it's even stronger within this scene than it is in defying gravity that scene between them is so powerful and i love it so much and i think that like regardless of any critiques that i say about this movie that nothing can take away that scene like no one could like I can't take away that scene from them because that was so perfect. It was, it was so sweet. It was so powerful. It was so both like the way no words were even exchanged. No words were even exchanged and they told a thousand within that scene. I, oh, no notes, no notes, perfect scene. And you did not think that I was gonna go through all everything that I liked about the movie and not talk about Cynthia Riva's voice because it's understood that she has the greatest voice ever. And you're probably tired of like hearing about it because like everybody has the same thing to say. Cynthia Rivo's voice is amazing within the Wicked movie, but I'm gonna say it anyways because she deserves her flowers. Like everybody deserves her flowers even if a million people have already said it. Like I'm gonna still praise the voices even if everyone's saying it. Voice, undeniable. And it's almost, I wish they kept more of the songs a secret. I wish they kept the run of Defying Gravity more of a secret because going into the movie, it's almost like I was, I already, I already knew the lengths of how her voice was gonna go to within the movie because they released so much of it before. So that's the one thing that I wish from this movie. I almost wish they kept so much of the music a secret from us so we could really see their voices at a full, like at the full powerhouse vocal level that they are 
first time when we saw the movie. I think that would have been amazing. That's a personal pet peeve of mine. It has nothing to do with the actual talents of the actresses. I loved seeing Ariana Grande push forward in that operatic sound when I think a lot of people are expecting such pop girl energy from her. And there's one time within um, I think it's popular where she does a little run and it sounds a little Ariana Grande And I, I almost love that little like Ariana Grande run where it sounded like one of her songs what they need. But then throughout the every other scene within the movie, it's super operatic. It's super Christian Chenoweth it's These things I send to trials The wicked workings of sounds really classical and I loved seeing that switch in her because I think it's not only a great switch for Ariana Grande the actress, I think it's a really good contrast to Elphaba's voice. The wizard, and I, I think that high pitch to Elphaba's more full i don't know how to, i don't know anything about music i don't know how to describe it in like technical terms but that fullness and that roundness of her voice uh contrasted to the highness and the the not sharpness but like you know operatic sound that is ariana grande's voice within this movie i thought it was a really good contrast for that i think my favorite song from elfie from cynthia i don't think it was defying gravity i think it was the wizard and i I don't know, usually I'm a big Defying Gravity like stan, like I love Defying Gravity. I listen to it all the time, I love it, I know it. But I think throughout this movie, I, I, I kind of resided more with The Wizard and I, and I really wasn't ever that big of a fan of The Wizard and I, like it wasn't something that I really listened to, but I think she just, she really shifted that for me. I really liked her rendition of The Wizard and I, I thought it was really good. And no matter what, I think what makes this movie work is the strong chemistry between the two main leads of Glinda and Elfie. I think that if that didn't work, the foundation of the movie would be off. I thought they had great chemistry. I thought it worked really well. I thought that it seemed very natural. It seemed very effortless. And I, I love that even though you know it's not effortless, like everybody puts a lot of effort into this movie. But I really loved how strong that was because it's such a vital point. And I was definitely gagged by the Christian Chenoweth and Idina Menzel cameo within Emerald City. I was gagged. I knew it was happening because someone spoiled it before I even got to the theater. But it still just made me like, I was just like, yeah, like it's perfect. Like, and I was surprised that no one in the theater was like, I thought that that was gonna get the reaction that like, Toby Maguire and Andrew Garfield got within No Way Home. Like that's what you, you guys should have been hooting and hollering, but no one was. Before I get into like things that I didn't like, I really want to talk about the ending sequence of Defying Gravity because it's a whole convoluted scene of Elphaba's view of the wizard and everything that she aspires to be shattered, right? She goes to the wizard, she thinks he's gonna grant her one desire and in this scene, he's being super nice and showing her that she could be up here one day with him in Emerald City, like ruling the land basically. They give her the grimmery. They tell her that, you know, only true wizards can read the grimmery and she can. They basically trick her into turning one of the monkeys into a flying monkey. He says it's his one true desire to fly up like the birds, even though this monkey doesn't fucking talk because guess what? Oz took away all the capabilities of animals to talk. Firstly, his soldiers. She does a spell, she gives the monkey some wings, and then realize she didn't just give that monkey wings, she gave all the monkeys wings. So she goes out and all the monkeys are literally in pain suffering because they're transforming and getting wings. And she's like, why the fuck do you need me to do this if you're the great and powerful Oz? Uh, then we find out the great and powerful Oz, not so great and powerful, which is kind of something that everyone knew because that's what happens in the Wizard of Oz. And is it too late to say that I've never seen The Wizard of Oz? And is it even worse to say that the only rendition of The Wizard of Oz that I've seen is the Muppets version? Starring cameo from Quentin Tarantino. Like, is it too late to say that? I don't know. Defying Gravity sequence, it's hyped up. Everybody talks about it. Everybody's talking about the Defying Gravity sequence and how it's amazing. It could have been, 
if they did color grading correct. It could have been actually really cool if they did. It could have been really cool if they didn't have a huge lens flare in the back of her, blurring out her entire silhouette that's the best fucking part. It could have been. I'm not distracted because she's on a broom. I am not one to be a uh, stickler for what's realistic and how realistic your flying looks. I really don't care. I can be immersed in pretty much anything. I do not need a lot to know that you can fly on a broom. It does not phase me that much. I will be if it looks like fucking doo-doo in the sky at sunset. Defying gravity takes place at sunset and it's the most muddled sky I've ever seen in my whole damn life. Defying gravity takes place at sunset over Emerald City and it looks so gray. It looks like shit. And I hate that because it's such a great and powerful scene of the song. And it has a lot of odes to the original stage production because in the stage production, the Elphaba goes up and to showcase that they're flying, she just goes straight up, but it makes a huge triangle almost of her cape. And they do that within the movie and it looks so good. The silhouette is so good, but there's this weird light flare at the back that's blurring out some of her silhouette. And it frustrates me because I think if that was a sharp and clean black silhouette of her Defying gravity, she's up in the air, it's a huge cape. I think that would have been amazing. And I was just so disappointed by how distracting it was. And I don't think it's distracting for everyone. I think that a lot of people can watch this movie and not be distracted by the way it looks in a coloring scheme. But if you cannot watch that, if you cannot not be distracted by it, it is, it is, it is like a sore thumb. Like it looks, bad like it's not just like oh it's like a little like it's not the best you know it's not giving like super cool stylistic you know coloring choices like twilight where it's all blue no it's like they even turn the saturation down so it looks really flat these super cool intense sets these amazing landscape shots and it's like the blues are gray. I forgot there's actually two scenes within the movie that utilize color very well. One is within The Wizard and I when she says degreenify you. They use glass and light to change the way she looks. So she goes from a uh, green complexion to a more natural complexion. And I think that's a sh super well use of lighting and coloring in the movie. And there's another scene within Popular where Ariana Grande is in the hallway by herself and it's super pink and it's super vibrant and those are two scenes that I think utilize color in a fantastic way. I think of fantasy as something that like can really entrance you and, and really have such power within the color palette of it all and to see that entire fantastical world be so dull by that really makes me sad. I think that's like I think that's a shame because even in the Emerald City everything is green everything's bright and everything is supposed to be fantastical. It's still got this like it's, it's there's something off about it. it's just not correct and it's like I heard that a lot of people turn down these saturations they choose a duller color palette because it makes CGI looks more realistic. I really I don't give a fuck if CGI looks realistic. You have talk you have a talking bear in the first scene of the movie. I do not give a fuck if the coloring makes the CGI look a little less realistic. I really don't care. I don't care. You have her flying on a broom. I do not care if it looks realistic. One more note on coloring because I know a lot of people are going to bring up this interview from John M. Chu, the director of the movie, where he is responding to the coloring criticisms of the movie. And he states that he wanted to make the film look more realistic and make the world look more realistic by comparing Wizard of Oz, which is technically a dream sequence. The whole movie takes place within a dream and is technically unreal. He wanted to make Oz seem like a real place place. So he made the coloring less saturated and more neutral to simulate a more realistic world. This is definitely a choice of words to make a reason for why the film looks like that. Regardless of that reasoning, I still think my criticisms stand because it does not really matter the reason for me why the film looks like that because I still think it looks bad. There has been no fantasy movie where I've ever wanted it to have more realistic coloring. In my opinion, I think that's a cop-out answer. And regardless of the reason, I still don't like it. <laughs>
And another thing that I disliked about the movie, and I do have to agree with when I saw the critiques of the movie, I do have to agree that it definitely felt like a two and a half hour movie. And I see a lot of people like rebuttaling to this uh, talking point that a lot of people are putting out is, you guys just don't have the attention span to handle long movies anymore. No, I watch a fair amount of long movies. Dune part two was long as fuck. Dune part two was long and I love that movie. I love that movie down bad. The first Dune was long. I love Dune part one. I love Dune part two. I'm a Dune stan. I have a short attention span, but you have everything that I love to keep my attention and it still felt long because it is long because the entire story of Wicked can fit in a two and a half hour time span and you're taking the first part and making it two and a half hours and you're dilly dallying around within the first like two acts of the movie and that's the problem John M. Chu. It's not because I just have the attention span of a fucking mouse. It's because it feels like a long movie because it, it is, it is a long movie and it feels like a long movie. And I think it's this kind of gray area that like John M. Chu and the makers of this film really sit in where it's like they wanted to make something and they were kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place of what they wanted to choose, whether that was make a movie that was for the musical like fans or make a movie just as a movie. And I do think that, uh, this is gonna be a hard one to say, that I do think that the Defying Gravity sequence, I think that they, how do I say this? I think that a lot of the interruptions within the Defying Gravity sequence, I think totally makes sense because that's how it is in the Sage production. And I'm not sure if it's like word for word, like scene breakups, just like the, stage production of Defying Gravity. But when I was watching the movie, I felt like every single time I was getting to a point, it was <laughs> it was almost like teasing me when I was watching it, where I was like, I, I was getting into it and it was building up to something. And then it was cut off by like the monkeys flying at them or like the guards like doing something. And it just felt like a lot of that momentum of Defying Gravity was kind of halted. And then she has the big belt at the end. And then it's like, I wish that had a little bit more fluidity to, to it rather than all these chops within it. And that's like a personal gripe. And that can be a gripe with the musical production as well, because there's also like pauses within the musical production as well. So it's not really like film critique, but my absolute, I hate this. I hate what they do in Defying Gravity. It's literally not at all to do with Cynthia or her voice. She sounds amazing. It's this fucking choice. It's right before the last riff of Defying Gravity. That, the iconic one, you know, they redid it. They did a new edition of it. It's like, she's up in the air. It's like the triangle cloak. It's an ode to the, the original stage production. It's amazing. And it does this fucking thing where they, where they they silence out. They basically cut all noise. And then they push that very big dramatic, ah, and it does this sound effect. And I fucking hate it. It goes zoom to showcase that the noise is going away. I hated that. I hated that so much. I thought that was so awful. I don't know why, but it was so, uh, it was so distracting to me. I don't know why I focused in on that so heavily. It's like this, like she's going, going, going. And then it's like, I, maybe they have it in the, what's it called? The recording. No, it's not in the recording, but it's in the fucking mute. It's in the fucking movie. It's not in the recording. It's this weird, like, it's to showcase that the music is cutting, but it's like, I hate it. It literally sounds like when like a, a superhero in a movie is like going to fly. It's like, like, it's so, uh, it's so distracting to me. I don't know why I was so fixated on that part, but I was literally like, so excited. I was like, yes, it's Defying Gravity. It's so good. And then whoosh, I was like, ah, oh, you just pissed me off. You just pissed me off because she sounds so brilliant. She sounds so good. And then you got a corny sound effect in the background and it sounds great in the, in the, in the recording. Why didn't they just do that? Why didn't you just do that? It sounds great in the recording, but no, you want to add weird stuff because you're weird. 
You're weird, John M. Chu. You're weird. This man, some of the choices were crazy. And you have to admit that some of John M. Chu's choices were crazy. They were absolutely bonkers. Some of them just don't work. And that was one of them. I don't know if that was his decision or someone else's, but that was awful. And I, and I hope everyone heard it because this cannot be another thing like in like challengers where I was like, guys, there was like a fart in the movie and everyone was like, no, there wasn't. Like it cannot be that. There was, there was literally a sound effect. It was like, and it was, I don't like it. She's lying around the room. I, I, I don't love that because I think it is like, I don't know, I feel like they put a lot of effort into it and they do a lot of theatrics like behind the scenes that she's hooked up in this corset and then she's on this rig and, and she's flying and she's flipping over and she's singing live and I think it was like a lot for like the actual like visuals of the movie, like the flying didn't really translate as well to a dramatic ending in my opinion. I love the slow build up of her just rising up. I love that dramatic effect rather than her like flying and flipping everywhere, you know? I think it's like cool, but I think that like the effectiveness of it wasn't as uh, effective as, you know, just this full on rise with the silhouette, you know? I love that sequence and it's a big sequence for many different reasons. Not only is she talking about defying the government and, and defying the system, but also Glinda basically saying that I am not going with you and that I'm gonna choose to stay and that I'm gonna choose to be submissive in you know this basically this fascist regime to gain the goals that I want because I have an ambition that this will choosing Madame Marble will lead to rather than choosing you, which will lead to a life of being scrutinized and villainized and on the wrong side of history. But the little moment where Glinda tells Elfie, she's like, you know, basically like, I'm not going. Glinda looks at Elfie and she's like, Elfie, you're trembling. And then she gets her like the big cloak and she gives her the cloak and they're crying together. I thought that was a really sweet scene and I really liked that. I think that was just, those little moments where they're not really speaking to each other, but they're saying a lot. Like, I like those moments. I like the quiet moments that we have with the character rather than the bigger moments, in my opinion. Cynthia and Ari will get nominated for the acting category, whether or not they choose to submit for supporting or lead. And I think that will be nominated for costume set design and obviously uh, sound or song will, they only do best original song and these aren't original songs. So I'm the only, the only person that I'm a hater of in this it, whole entire thing is John M. Chu. Like really, like I, that he is my biggest enemy for some reason within this film. Like, but I think that there were a lot of choices in this film creatively uh, and the and the directing choices were that were not my favorite. And that's okay. If you loved the movie and you have no notes to say about it, I love that. I love that because it's that's the whole point. Everybody's supposed to have different experiences with film and everyone's supposed to have different interpretations and different, you know, experiences with the film. And the Wicked is such a personal experience that a lot of people have such personal stories attached to that it's impossible to make the movie without people having uh, a vastly different reaction to it, whether or not they're a fan or not. I think if anything, the only thing that I wish I didn't do was look at reviews online. I think the only thing that I would have changed about my viewing experience is I wish I filtered out what people were posting about it before I saw it because I think it kind of led me to have some expectations of the film which kind of skewed my viewing experience because then I was a little underwhelmed because I was expecting more. I think that overall for something like this, I think I should have just gone in without any outside views or uh, opinions because I really did get my expectations up for like something huge. And as much as I liked it, I just wasn't that huge to me, which is like crazy because it's everything that I like, right? I don't know why, maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe like I need to get that checked out because uh, it's kind of out of character for me to not be like head over heels for this. You know what I mean? Like. Something's wrong, something's wrong in my brain. But I think I was expecting so much because of the like vastly emotional reactions that we've been seeing from the cast and the crew. You know, obviously Cynthia and Ariana have been having very emotional uh, interviews and, and getting very deep and, and very intimate within those interviews and sharing how vulnerable they were and sharing these experiences and how much it meant to them and you know how how grateful were they were for this opportunity to be in it and I think that for some reason made me think it was gonna it got my expectations up for some reason I don't know why seeing someone so emotionally invested into these characters that they're portraying I don't know I was expecting a lot from it 
And I think that that will come eventually. I think part two is going to be way better. I think, in my prediction, I think part two is going to be insanely better. I think that like that a part of the reason why they have such emotional reactions is because they've already filmed part two. It was all filmed at once. They like already know the 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 way the second movie goes and what they have filmed. So I think that this the part two is going to be like way better than the first part because, because part one of Wicked does suffer from part one syndrome of movies. And that's how it is with all part ones. Even my favorite movies, even something like Dune, like it suffers from part one syndrome. There's no way you can split a movie into half. There's no way you can split a movie in half, especially something like, you know, the stage production of Wicked where it's like, you don't really need to split it into two being as there's, the stage production isn't that long. Every single part one movie suffers from part one syndrome of just being kind of off and, and, and unsatisfying. And that's just the nature of it all. And I don't blame the movie for that because even my favorite movies, like I said, like Dune, Part one syndrome. Uh, any big franchise, Harry Potter, Deathly Hallows part one. Ugh, that thing crawled. Like that thing was so fucking slow. Mockingjay part one, bruh. Talk about movies that feel long. Part ones have a syndrome and, and it's too long-itis. It's too long and it feels long and that's just the nature of it all. And so I don't think that's necessarily a fault within this movie specifically. I'm excited for part two though. I think that even though I was a little underwhelmed, I think I had skewed expectations of this movie. I think that even though I was a little underwhelmed, I think it was a good start to it, but I think there were things that could have been improved and things that could have been changed. And if you don't agree with them, that's completely fine. If you think the movie is perfect the way it is, I'm so happy for you. I think that everybody gets to enjoy the movie how they want to enjoy it and this is how I did. I think that the music and the way everyone sounds is perfect, undeniable, like perfect, 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 no notes, no, no notes. A lot of the things that I have critiques for come from production choices and creative choices that are the directors made. And that's a real thing that I have with a lot of different movies. But anyways, leave your comments down below whether or not you liked this movie or not. I would love to know, even if your opinion differs from mine, even if you hate me for my opinions, it's the way of the land, it's okay. I am going to do a video on part two because I'm excited for part two. I think it's gonna be even, I think it's gonna be better. I think it's gonna be better by a long shot. Part twos are just climactic. They're just exciting. There's just so much stuff. You don't have to set up anything. And that's the best part of a part two is that you don't have to, you basically don't have to do any setup, world building or exposition on anything. Everything is already there. And so I think it's gonna be a really good movie. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you guys want to follow me on Patreon, my Patreon will be linked in the description. It's trend level. You guys can subscribe so you can see more videos from me. You guys can follow me on Twitter or Blue Sky. I'm actually on Blue Sky now and Instagram. All links to those will be in the description box down below and you guys can keep updated with me and see what I'm talking about, what I'm reviewing next. All of the sorts, go follow me there. And give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed. Do not give it a thumbs down if you did not enjoy it. And I'll see you guys in my next video to chat about another movie. Bye.